All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming out. First of all, you are here to listen to the first in a series um, that we've entitled The Unlovables. So this first one is on The Unlovable Bats. Let's go ahead and get started with a little bit of some introductions. First of all, let me give a quick um, description of the Arizona Game and Fish Department, which is where I work for. If you're not familiar with us, we are the state government agency that is responsible for managing all of Arizona's wildlife species. There are over 800 native wildlife species that we manage. Most people interact with us through hunting and fishing. So when you go buy a hunting or fishing license, and then you go out and hunt, and the law enforcement that's taking place to make sure that you're following those rules and regulations, that's where a lot of people interact with us. But we are much more than just the hunted and species. We are all wildlife, even those that you cannot hunt or fish, the ones that we call the non-game species, and also our endangered and threatened species. Under there, we do Focus Wild Arizona, which is our, our wildlife education program, which is kind of what I oversee and what, what I run. That is our K-12 formal classroom piece. And so when you're, when, when, when you're talking about stuff that's being brought into the classroom or into the education environment as whole, because I understand that many of you are not teachers, classroom teachers, you may be working for a park or a nonprofit or a library or a number of different things. That education piece, when we're talking about just general wildlife education, that's under Focus Wild Arizona, and that's kind of what I operate. And then my name is Eric Proctor. I'm the Wildlife Education Coordinator. I work kind of behind the scenes, so my role is to help you guys as educators bring wildlife concepts, wildlife issues into your teaching environment, whether it's a classroom, park, whatever that might be. Prior to that, I was a middle school science teacher. I taught seventh grade mostly science, but I also did some social studies and some language arts. I did a little bit of math in there as well. And what you'll see as we go through some of this stuff and we, we talk about some of these lessons and how you can integrate some of the stuff into your classroom, you'll see a very multidisciplinary approach because it comes from those teaching days where not only was I teaching science, but I was teaching these other subjects. And so while we are a science organization and obviously our focus is on science, you will find stuff that we do with social studies, with language arts, with math, with art, all different types of things. We won't cover all of those necessarily today, but we'll give you a good start on some of that stuff and you'll see kind of where we come from. I wanted to start kind of where the concept or the inspiration for this, this series called The Unlovables came from. And it actually came from a book that I read a number of years ago. And I've always had it in my my idea, my heart and my, my mind that, that this would make for a really cool workshop series. There was a book, I don't believe it's in print anymore. You probably have to find it secondhand or through some, some um, auction sites or resale sites. It's, it's a book called Animals Nobody Loves and it's by Ronald Rood. Um, and each chapter is devoted to a different animal that people historically haven't taken kindly to. Bats are some of the vultures are in there. There's octopus in there. Uh, there's rats and wolves and spiders. And so there's chapters devoted to this. And, and so that kind of became the basis. I don't take a lot of information from that book just because there's more current information, but that, that became the basis and the inspiration for this. This particular quote, however, did come from that book. It actually came, he quoted a different book, a, a of natural history. So there was a science book detailing the natural history of some of the different animals out there. And you can see this is what was actually officially published when they were talking about bats. The bat has sharp claws at the corner of his wings. He hides away in sheds and barns in the daytime. The bat is half quadruped and half bird and is neither one or the other, a kind of monster. It is an animal not less mischievous than it is deformed. It is a pest of man, the torment and destruction of animals. Bats suck the blood of horses, of mules, and even of men when they do not guard against it. That was science's depiction of bats and their portrayal of bats. And you can, you can sort of see it's not a very great description. And obviously some of this stuff has been changed. We know that this isn't, men, many of the things in the statement aren't true, but oftentimes these ideas stick with us through time a little bit. So we're gonna spend some time talking about bats, hopefully getting rid of some of those misconceptions and then bringing some ideas back into your classroom. Bats and birds and insects fly, but they belong to different animal classes. Birds are in a class called aves. Insects belong to the class insecta, while bats are in the class mammalia. Bats are mammals, just like humans. 
which means that all bats are warm-blooded, they have hair, they bear live young, and they feed their babies milk. However, one misconception out there is that bats are just a flying mouse, and that's not the case. Bats are not rodents. They are a completely separate order, a completely separate family of organisms. There are about 1,100 species of bats in the world. They are 21% of all mammal species. They are only behind rodents for the greatest diversity of species in the mammals, in, in, of mammals. So they are not a flying mouse. They are unique of themselves. They belong to the order Chiroptera. Their scientific name, it comes from the Greek words meaning hand for Cairo and terra meaning wing. So they literally mean hand wing. The bones in the bat's wings are somewhat like those in the human hand, only much, much longer. You can see here, comparison of the different arm bones of the human, the bird, and the bat. You can see where they overlap a little bit. The particular, what I really like about the comparison is to compare the bird wings with the bat wings. And you can see that um, the bird pretty much flies with their, their wing is composed of their entire bones. All of their arm bones can come together to make their wing. The bat, for the most part, flies with their fingers. Those finger bones are extended out the metacarpals are extended out there. You can see, and even the phalanges come out there a little bit and make the main part of their wing. So they fly very differently than birds do. Bats are the only flying mammals. Flying squirrels and flying lemurs are simply gliders. There are two suborders of bats that I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about them, but I do want you to be aware. There's what we call the micro bats and the mega bats. The micro bats, given their name, tend to be smaller, although there is an overlap between the megabats and the microbats, but the microbats tend to be smaller. The megabats typically don't use echolocation. We'll talk about that a little bit later, what echolocation is if you're not familiar with it, but they tip it, the megabats typically don't, eat, don't use um, echolocation. They typically don't have tails, and they tend to have larger eyes than the microbats. Do. There are a couple other distinctions about them. We actually have um, a few megabats in Arizona, but most of what we have are microbats. So there is that distinction. We're not going to spend a ton of time in, the, in there talking about them, but I wanted to make you guys aware of that. As I mentioned, there are about 1,100 species of bats in the world. Arizona, we have 28 species that have been identified within our borders. That's second most of all states. Uh, second only behind Texas, and I believe they have 29 or 30 species of bats. So we the second most diverse for bat species. Now, look really cool. Look like a fox. This is a flying fox with a dog-like face and big eyes. Larger eyes allow these bats to visually locate fruit. Ears are smaller when compared to the echolocated bats. Um, echolocation is not common among the flying foxes. This would be an example of a megabat, since they are not hunting fast flying insects. Others look like rabbits with large ears. Some have mohawks. Some wear shoulder pads. Some have teeny tiny little eyes. And others have tails. Now, what I want to point as we go through some of this, as you go through the presentation, you're going to notice that I do try to highlight the names of these species as we come along. Um, if it's a bat that is found in Arizona, you'll see the little Arizona flag and state that I put there. These, a lot of these other bats, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time talking about Arizona bats, but sometimes I, I do want to highlight some that aren't in Arizona. So you'll see the ones that we're talking about that are in Arizona um, can be found with the little um, flag symbol there. And you can see that's a picture of a Mexican free tail bat which we'll be talking about a little bit. Let's continue with some of our diversity. Some have funny faces. Some have great big pink ears. This is the spotted bat, which is actually one of our most striking bats that we have in Arizona. You're gonna see another picture of him in just a minute. Long noses. This is the Mexican long tongue bat. One of the most common myths about bats is that they are blind. In fact, no bats are blind. And some like this Mexican long tongue bat have rather large eyes that they actually use for finding food. These are nectar feeding bats characterized by long funnel shaped snouts and the leaf like structure at the tip 
helps pollinate plants as the bat moves from one plant to another. While some have long noses, others have almost no nose at all. Even bats like this ghost face bat with very small eyes are not blind and can see quite well. However, since almost all bats are nocturnal, meaning they only come out at night, many of them rely on other senses besides sight for getting around. The great diversity in appearances of bat faces can give us some idea about the diversity of adaptations that they have for their environment. And we're going to talk about adaptations in just a little bit here. Our spotted bat again, some of our, some of our bats even have spots. Some come in many different colors. This, is the, this one is a yellow winged bat. So there is an incredible diversity across those 1,000 species of bats that we have in the world. Let's do a quick little activity here, and this is where you're going to be get a chance to, to engage a little bit. I've listed three species of bats, the common names of three species of bats in the green column that says spotted bat, big brown bat, and the western yellow bat. And then on the in the orange column on the right, what you're going to see are the scientific names for those three species, but they are not lined up correctly. What I want you to do is using the clues on the left-hand side in that column that says some common words that are used to name bats, I want you to try to match up the scientific name with the common name. You can go ahead and start throwing some of that into the chat, and then we'll see how you guys do. Give you guys just a moment on that. So let's see how you guys did. It wasn't a, a, a ridiculously hard activity, but we start with Zan, Z, uh, I don't know how to speak any of these languages, but Xanthinus means yellow. So you probably pulled that out of there that that probably means the Western yellow bat. Next one up was the Macalatum, which if you were to look on the definition side means spotted. So that's probably going to give us some indication that it belongs to the spotted bat. And then our other one, the key word to pull out of that was the, the, the Fuscus, which means brown, which of course would link us up to big brown bat. Just to highlight um, where you could go with this next is um, you could actually have your students. You don't need to do this right now. This is just an example of, of what I would have the students do next is that they just discovered a new bat species and they have the opportunity to name it. So they go through a longer list of scientific names, Latin, Latin and Greek words that are very common in bat naming. They can name their bat, but then they have to draw a picture of their bat. So they're tying in. Um, some of these other features in there a little bit. Again, just a really quick activity if you're introducing classification, um, scientific names, all those different types of stuff, and you want to do a little bit fun. Let's do another quick activity. You're not going to do the graphing part of this, but you'll get the chance to, to do a quick analysis. The graph's not that difficult. This is another sheet that was put together well, a number of years ago, but it lists the, the 45 main species, and then there's some subspecies in there as well of the bats that are found in the United States and Canada. And I know you can't see it very well. You have access to this as an eight and a half by 11 printout that becomes much easier to read. What I like about this though, is it indicates which of those bat species are species of special concern and which are even further along and are endangered. And so those are indicated by the, the, the initials at the end that say SC for special concern or END, which stands for endangered. And so this lends itself to a, a somewhat decent graphing activity. So what I would have kids do at this point is to say, make a pie chart showing the total number of bats compared to those that are endangered and those that are of special concern. And then what percentage of the bats is in need of protection? And so if they were to do that, what you'd end up with is a, is a pie chart that looks something like this. So now you're incorporating some new math skills into your bat instruction, where now the kids have to make a pie chart. I just did this very, very quickly. You can see here that 13% of the species that are in, in the United States and Canada, based on the data provided in this in here, are endangered, and 35% are special concern. The other ones doesn't mean they're not protected. It's just that their populations are, are doing a little bit better than the other. Um, but again, they don't have to fall under special concern or endangered just to have special protections on them. There are laws that protect bats in general. So you can see here, then they can they can add that up and say, oh, well, of th that total then, about 48% then are of some kind of special protection in here. You could then expand on that. Do endangered bats appear to come from family more than any other? 
or are they fairly well distributed? So does it does it tend to be a particular family, which may indicate a particular adaptation that may be threatened? Um, also, they could I, they could use another reference to identify these are the forty five bat species that are found in U S. and Canada. They could identify those that are found in Arizona or whatever state and figure out if those those percentages are the same. Do we have roughly thirteen percent of the bats in Arizona that are endangered, or is that different? If it's different, then why? Why might why might we have more endangered, or why might we have less endangered? Just some things that they can start thinking about. Um, in addition to the graphing that they did. This here is Lyle's flying fox. It is a flying fox from Papua New Guinea with a wingspan of almost six feet. So compare that to the smallest bat in the world is the bumblebee bat, or also called Kitty's hognose bat. It has a wingspan of five and a half inches. So from five and a half inches to five and a half feet. It's the size of a jelly bean and it weighs less than a penny. So that's the range of bats in the world. Ours in Arizona aren't quite as big of a range. On the left-hand side, the little small bat that you see there right next to the ruler is the canyon bat, used to be called the western pipistrel, is our, the smallest bat that we have in Arizona, and the greater western mastiff bat is the largest bat that's found in Arizona. Um, and you can see that they, they range usually between two to four inches long is, is the ones you're gonna find in Arizona. On average, a bat's wingspan is about five times its body length. So if you were a five foot tall person, or if your kids were five feet tall, that would mean that their wingspan would be 25 feet. Okay. So you could actually get PVC pipes and put uh, across at that length, and you could have to hold that out to see what that would potentially look like if, 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 if they were at their size, um, how big those wings would need to be. So what do bats eat? 70% of all bat species are what we call insectivores. Most of these bats catch flying insects on the wing. Um, so they will catch bugs, mosquitoes, things like that that are in the air flying. Moths, you have a picture of the long-eared myotas eating a moth. Little brown bat can eat up to 600 mosquito-sized insects in an hour. And if you're not familiar, there's, a, there's in Texas, there's the Bracken Cave, which is probably one of the most bat caves in the world. Um, there are about 20 million free Mexican free-tailed bats that live in that cave, and they can eat 200 tons, 200 tons of insects a night. There are a few out there that do eat some small animals. These ones are not found in Arizona, but you can see there are bats that eat frogs. There are bats that eat fish. They get lizards and some other small animals in there as well. Fruit and nectar. There is one species of bat in Arizona that will eat fruit on um, the long-nosed bat, which you see there. It, it eats the nectar of plants, but it will eat, it's been known to eat the fruit of saguaros and organ pipe cactus as well. In the tropics, these fruit-eating bats are a major pollinator. They help spread the seeds of a great variety of rainforest plants. We have an activity in our bat box where it has a lunch box in it. And inside that lunch box is all the different products that are pollinated as a direct result of bats. And so it talks about like what would be in their lunch, like a banana or raisins, things like that, that are pollinated by bats. And so to illustrate kind of the role that bats have and the importance of bats are in our world. Lesser long-nosed bats, they're pollinating agave in this picture. They are critical pollinators of many species of agave, including the wild varieties of agave that gives us tequila. So we can thank bats for the fact that we have margaritas. Here in Arizona, the same adaptations that allow these bats to visit flowers to get the neck also help them exploit some of the non-traditional resources. It's not uncommon to see bats at hummingbird feeders. Right there, the lesser long nose sticking his tongue right into the hummingbird feeder to get some food. There is the infamous or famous, depending on your, your perspective, vampire bat. There are bats that actually eat blood, but it's not quite in the way that we typically picture. It's not Dracula. It's not vampires. They do drink blood. It's not nearly the violent, traumatic experience that movies make it out to be. Vampire bats are fairly small with a wingspan of about eight inches and a body about the size of my thumb. They most commonly feed on farm livestock, especially cows and chickens. 
as one of the few bats that can easily navigate on the ground, they will often land near a sleeping animal and approach it on foot. So they'll actually crawl along the ground. They have special heat sensors that allow them to find the spot where blood vessels are closest to the skin. They then use their sharp teeth, make a small cut, and they actually lap the blood up with their tongue. So they don't suck any blood. They, cut, they, they poke in a little bit so that blood starts coming out, and then they lick it up just like a dog is licking water out of a bowl. They don't suck. They have a special anticoagulant in their saliva that keeps the blood from clotting. Scientists are now studying that anticoagulant for help in developing drugs for heart patients. We think that that might be beneficial, whatever the bats are using, the chemical, the enzyme, whatever it is to stop the animal's blood from, we might be able to, to, to recreate that in the lab and then make it a medicine that can help people that have heart conditions. Vampire's meal is only about two tablespoons of blood. So to a huge cow, that's not much more than a mosquito bite. Despite their bad reputation, vampires are actually very altruistic and will feed roost mates who do not get a meal one day and even adopt orphan bats. So again, the movies exaggerate a little bit. This is part of that misconception that we have about bats based on some of our movies and Dracula and things like that. What about Arizona? I mentioned before that we have 28 species of bats in Arizona, all but two. So 26 species of bats in Arizona eat insects. The other two, they eat the nectar. So we have nectar feeders, make up two, and then 26 of them eat insects. That's what we have here. We don't have vampire bats. Those get further into Central and South America. We don't have the fruit-eating bats other than a few of the, those that, that eat a little bit of the fruit from the, the saguaros and the, and the organ pipes. So how does this work? If you're not familiar with, with echolocation, this is basically how a hunting bat is going to find its prey. You can see it illustrated here, or our bat species here. They send out a signal through a frequency that often we can't hear as humans. We do have devices. We have bat detectors, sonar detectors, that will allow us to hear some of these sounds. But they send out a sound, and then as it goes out, it bounces off of objects and gets sent back to them. You can see that in the illustration of the waves. And then that helps them that that help them determine how far away that particular animal or whatever it might be is. So that's how echolocation works. If you want a really good illustration of this in your classroom, go get a really big slinky or a, a slinky works really best. Have two kids stand across the room, each one holding one end of it, and then have one pull back on the slinky and then let go. So you send a wave down the slinky. You'll send it down to the person on the other side, and it'll come back to them. So you're illustrating this echolocation in a physical embodiment with the, with the slinky so that they can see how this wave motion works and how they might detect this a little bit. Let's take a little bit of an activity break again. So what I've done is I've listed a few different adaptations that are common in different bat species that are found here in Arizona. All I want you to do is take a look at each one and try to identify, would that adaptation be more beneficial to a nectar feeding bat or an insect feeding bat. So think about how insect feeders get their, get their food. They, they use the echolocation, they send those wave signals out that bounce back and they can tell how far out the, the insect is. Nectar feeders, have the, they go into the flower to get the, they feed the nectar that's inside the flower. So those are the two different types of bats we have in Arizona. What adaptations would help them? So let's start with the long scaly tongue. If you'll just take a moment, um, and take a look at what, what would that be better for an insect or a nectar feeder? Long, scaly tongue. Looks like most people that have answered are saying nectar, so let's And we have green. Actually, somebody brought up a good point that it could be either, that maybe they use that tongue to dig, and that, that is true. It's possible that that could be. Uh, most bass, as I mentioned before, they are eating insects on the wing they're actually catching them in air um use that obviously there's going to be some overlap with some of these um, we are just i'm just giving you some ideas here of, of what would be most beneficial would it be more beneficial for an insect feeder or a nectar feeder based on that so good good call let's look at the next one which i think i gotta make sure i'm doing this correctly um is excellent eyesight and smell i think we go down excellent eyesight 
sense of smell, would that be most useful for feeding on insects or feeding on plants? Most people saying nectar, that the smell would be good for nectar. And actually, I'm. You are correct. It is nectar. So, yeah, the excellent eyesight and the sense of smell is going to allow them to smell the flower and, and come in and, and find that also to be able to see that in there. All right, let's look at the next one short, wide wings with to help them hover in one spot. Is that going to be insect or nectar? Insect or nectar? Most people are saying nectar. There's been a couple insect ones that have popped up. This case is another case of nectar. The hovering gives them the ability to stop at the flower, just like a hummingbird would, and to be able to stay in one place while they extract the nectar out of the flower. Good. All right. Extremely good echolocation. We've already talked about this a little bit. We indicated that. Would that be better for insects or for, for flowers? People are getting this one. We're getting it into insect. And of course, you are correct on that one. This is good for insect. The flowers don't move. And so they don't have a need to, to piece them down. The echolocation is really good. It allows them to see how the bug is moving in space. With, a thing, with something that's not moving, that's immobile, they don't need to worry about that as much, as long as they can see it and they can smell it, which we've already indicated that those would have good sense of spell. Insects are good for, um, insect eaters have really good echolocation. Long, narrow nose. Long, narrow nose. Is that going to be good for plants or for insects? A little bit of a hint. It might tie in with their sense of smell. And of course, we are correct on that. That would be a nectar. Um, not only is it going to help that show um, adaptation of a better sense of smell, but it's also going to, a lot of those flowers that rely on nectar feeders to get pollinated put the nectar deep down in the flower by doing that the animal has to stick its head further into the flower which means that they're more likely to pick up the pollen and then when they go to the next flower that pollen that's all over their head um, when, when they dip their head into the next flower that pollen is going to get spread out so by the flower having its nectar deep down in the flower it helps them spread the pollen a little bit better so the bat having a long nose that flower a, a lot better and the last one here is long narrow wings and large tail membrane to fly fast and have good maneuverability Those people of course have been able to identify that that's going to be good for hunting insects um, the maneuverability that the tail give them that directional piece that's going to allow them to maneuver the, the moth that they're chasing is flying all over the place very sporadically, so they're going to need to be able to maneuver just as well. Which means if you've ever watched a bat fly at night, they fly very differently than birds, not only because of that wing structure that we talked about, that bone structure, but because they're chasing these, these things that are darting in all these different directions. And so their, their flight looks very different. They don't soar as much as some of the other species. And also asked, is it possible to avoid predators as well? And absolutely, all of the, all these adaptations are likely going to serve more than one purpose than just for feeding and being able to maneuver is going to help them to evade predators again if you've ever watched that it's very common to have night hawks which will fly right through these flocks of bats and and we'll, we'll try to take some of them out and so the ability to maneuver through there i've also been to the phoenix bat tunnel the one that's over off of camelback and um i've had great horned owls there and the great horned owls will sit perched and as soon as the bats start to the great horned owl will jump down and, and try to try to take out some of the bats. So where do bats live? This is um, pictures of lesser long-nosed bats that are sitting on some cable netting in a, in a cave. Um, with one or two exceptions, all bats hang upside down when they're resting. Their knees are actually rotated, so they bend backwards. And they have special tendons in their ankles so that they are able to hang by their toes with no effort. In fact, if a bat dies while roosting, it will continue to hang upside down. It's actually easier for them to hang upside down, and their body has specific adaptations for them to do that. So it's, le it's, it's, it's less comfortable if they were actually to be standing upright. And as I mentioned, because of those adaptations, if they were to die, they would just stay there. It's not like they would, their, 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 their feet wouldn't loosen up and they would fall to the ground. 
So they can live in all different types of places, from caves. Most people are familiar with caves, mines, empty mine shafts, bridges. It's very common to see them under bridges and attics. Not uncommon to see them up in attics. I believe a Pioneer History Museum up in North Phoenix. Um, I think there's some some bats that come out of the schoolhouse attic or the clock tower. Something some in one of those. There's a colony of bats that lives in there, and it's not a huge colony, but there's some bats that live in the attic. They've been known to live in trees. You can see all those bats hanging there. They look like leaves, and of course, in some cases, they'll actually be found under loose bark. Any tight little quarter that they can hang upside down that gives them some space. They don't need a lot of space, and in fact, they'll 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 jam themselves into into tiny little little quarters. Here's a great picture. You might have seen it on the side of some of my of some of my slides. We call this a free tail sandwich. This is a um, a colony of Mexican free tails. This is probably under a bridge, and they're they're jammed into the, the trusses in there. Mexican free tail bat bats are the ones that have the the largest colonies. So when you think about the large bat that you might be familiar with, Bracken Cave in Texas that I've already talked about, um, the Phoenix Bat Cave over by Camelback, if some of you have been to that, that is largely free-tailed bats. Most of the, when you hear about these large bat caves, they're mostly Mexican free-tailed bats. They can potentially have millions of babies in one of these colonies. And what I find absolutely fascinating is that they can jam themselves into such a tight quarter that they can have the 500 individual bats per square foot. Now, if you want to try something interesting, and I did this for one of my workshops earlier, is I cut out a, a, a square foot piece of cardboard, and then I tried to put 500 cotton balls on that square piece, that, that single square foot of thing, and I ran out of space when I got to about 350, and I was just trying to jam them in there wherever I could. I, I just squirted on there, and I just started putting cotton balls wherever I can. And it got really, really difficult after about 350. But then it became a great visual to see just how jammed these guys could get. Mother bats use a variety of strategies, mostly different types of senses, to help. If you've got a colony that big and you've got 500 bats jammed into just a single square foot, essentially, how does a mother who might go out hunting come back and be able to find the baby in all of that mess? They're able to do it pretty accurately through, through a variety of techniques we've talked about. Mothers and pups recognize each other's unique voices at least three feet away. And they move toward one another despite the incredible confusion of calls emanating from countless thousands of other bats. They recognize each other's calls. Multiple landings are typically required to find a pup, each bracketing its location in a manner suggesting that a mother is triangulating onto her pup's voice. So they'll actually try about three or four different times until they get get it right on. Finding her young can take as little as 12 seconds to nearly 10 minutes. She most commonly feeds her pup before she goes out to feed and again when she returns in the morning. The final recognition is by scent. So they, they triangulate down and get in the general area. So what remains to be discovered whether the scent is the scent is placed on the pup from glands on the mother's face or whether each pup has its own unique odor. So we don't know the answer to that yet. There is a scent. We don't know if the scent is passed down through the mother or if the baby has a scent and the mother just recognizes it. A successful reunion ends with the mother touching the top of her pup's head with her muzzle, apparently smelling and exchanging vocalizations with it. So sort of that final confirmation that they have found each other. Such exchanges can last for a minute or more before the mother raises her folded wing and nudges the pup, pup in so that she could feed her. Because they're mammals, so they feed on, they nurse when they're that young. So the mother will go out and find food and then we'll come back and then we'll nurse the babies once they're successfully able to find them. All right, let's do a little bit of math. For our purposes here, Mexican free tail bats produce one pup each year. Let's do. How many pups will a colony of 5 million per, um, females produce in one summer? So if you'll just throw in some answers there based on, on that information is um, if there's 5 million females and they can produce one pup each sum, each year, how many can that colony, how many babies will, will be produced? Not very difficult math. Most of you know, figure out that they're going to produce 5 million babies. If half of the babies are eaten by predators or die, 
during their migration because free tails do migrate. Most of them do. How many are left over? How many are going to survive the migration? It's about two and a half million. And then quarter, one quarter of the remaining die in the winter or during the migration back to Arizona, how many of those 5 million that were born are going to make it back to Arizona the following year? One quarter of the remaining die. We got some people that are getting the math going there. So roughly about 6 million, um, 600,000 are going to die, so you're going to have in the vicinity of about 1.9. The accurate answer is 1.875, but rounding up about 1.9 million are going to make it. Okay. And obviously, you're going to have a lot of the survivals from before, and so those now are all going to be, this. that's going to be representing the, what, the, the new colony that's going to come in there, is the survivors from before, and then there's almost 2 million new babies that, that, that made it through. Now, I did have a question up here before. Uh, I think Craig asked another question. Do they hang upon each other? Um, that way they would fit in one square foot. That's a, that's a good question. I can't say for certain. I don't know the answer to that question. My guess would be no. They, and they just kind of squeeze in there, the, the little feet in there, and they're probably bumping pretty close to each other. But I, I, it's possible that they could hang from each other. Um, I don't know the answer to that. That is a good question. I could probably try to investigate that a little bit. So now let's let's revisit this theme a little bit that we had at the beginning. There's a great little quote from uh, from Bertrand Russell: "Fear is the main source of superstition and one of the main sources of cruelty. To conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom." And I think this is a good quote that kind of summarizes kind of our goal with these overall workshop series on the unlovables. Is many times we're fearing some of these animals, and that's why we don't like them. And I'm not saying that any of you don't like bats. Many of you probably do. But there are people genuinely fear bats. And the way to conquer that fear is to learn, to, 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 to be wiser about them, and to understand. And that's hopefully what we're doing here a little bit. So there are a few common misconceptions out there. One of the ones is that bats get stuck in your hair. And that is an absolute fallacy. Bats, through their echolocation, can actually or have the capability of detecting something smaller than a human hair. Something smaller than a human hair, the width of a human hair, they can detect with their echolocation. So there's no reason why it wouldn't detect your hair when it's flying over you and put in. It's likely buzzing your head because there's probably some gnats or some other bugs that just happen to be nearby your head. And it's buzzing by trying to get that food when it's flying over. But it's not going to get tangled up in your hair. We've already addressed the other one, which is um, bats suck your blood. They don't. First of all, we don't have vampire bats in Arizona. We don't really even have them in the United States. They get further south into the tropics. But they don't they don't even suck the blood. If they were to, it would be a matter of by, um, they pinch the skin a little bit so that they get some blood released, and then they lap it up like a, like a, like a dog would. Um, and then bats have rabies. Now, this is a little bit different here because that, that's true. It's not a misconception, but I think the level of rabies that bats have is often the misconception that we have. So like most mammals, an occasional bat may contract rabies, but even those that do are typically non-aggressive, biting only in self-defense if handled. In fact, research seems to indicate that bats, as far as mammals go, mammals that get rabies, because not all mammals can get rabies, at least as far as we know, the, the rate of bats with rabies, we think, is actually less than it is with other mammals like dogs. The, the problem is, so, so there's millions of bats out there, and a, a very, very small percentage of bats actually have the rabies, but the problem is that your likelihood of encountering a bat that has rabies is probably higher, because if you encounter a bat that's on the ground, for example, it's likely a sick bat, and there's a problem with it. Most bats, you're gonna, you're, you're not going to encounter most bats. They're going to be flying up in the sky, so you, you don't have that. So when you do see a bat, there's a good chance it might be a sick one. And so I think that that's what gives our, our discrepancies. Oh, every bat that I see has rabies. That's true to some extent, but, but there's millions of other bats that you're not seeing or that you're not running into or not encountering that don't have rabies. So the percentage of bats that have rabies is smaller than other mammals, but our, our rate that we encounter them may be a little bit higher. Um, rabies is nearly always transmitted by a bite. 
However, non-bite exposures can result from contact between infected saliva or nervous tissue, open wounds, uh, mucous membranes, so you can get rabies through some of those. Worldwide, about 50,000 humans die of rabies each year. A majority of these cases are from contact with dogs. There's only about two to three deaths in the U.S. each year. Uh, careless handling is the primary source of rabies exposure from bats. So the key message there is if you see a bat on the ground, it's, it's likely going to be an unhealthy bat and one that you don't want to mess around with. So that's where you want to call in and get experts to deal with that um, and not be handling it because there's a good chance. So it doesn't mean that if it got stuck in your, I, I, my kid's um, school got one stuck in their, in their gymnasium. Um, it wasn't a sick bat. It just happened to get stuck in the gymnasium. So they had to work in, on trying to get it out the doors. But we're talking about a bat that might be on the ground, things like that. More people die of playground injuries every year than people that die of, of rabies, especially from bats. I, I like this. I like some of these old photos I found when I was researching from here. Some of these crazy, some of the things we used to do with, with playgrounds. I, th I thought some of these historical photos were kind of funny. There's a myth out there that these large bat populations that you might have in communities like Phoenix, where we have the, the bat tunnel, or out by Wickenburg, where we have the bridge, many people feel that that's a greater likelihood of them bringing in rabies into an urban population. And there's no studies that seem to indicate that. There's no evidence that links large bat populations to increase rabies transmissions in humans. I mentioned before, only two to three humans in the U.S. die of rabies. Um, so the, the the amount is so small anyway, and there's really been no increase in that over over the years. So it doesn't seem to. So so there's no reason why. I guess what my point is is to say that we shouldn't be scared of these bat populations. We shouldn't be pushing to say, oh, we need to make sure that these bat populations get away, or you know, we need to make sure that we don't have them in the Phoenix area or the Tucson area, or the Yuma area, or wherever it is that you have to be living. There's no evidence that large populations are going to increase our rabies transmission. So what should you do if you find a bat? Common sense, and I've kind of already hinted at this a little bit, don't handle, and this goes for, most of these are gonna go for any animal that you encounter. Don't handle any unfamiliar animal. As I mentioned, if you if you can handle the bat, it's likely gonna be a sick bat, and that's true for most animals. Any wild animal, if you can touch it and come up to it, there's a good chance that it might be sick or it might be rabid. 90 to 95% of sick bats are not rabid, but you don't wanna take your chance. You don't wanna take a chance of getting bit. To, to give you an example, I in my job here, we handle bats regularly, but I, for example, am not allowed to handle bats because I don't have my rab my rabies pre -vaccine. Um Anybody that handles bats through our department as part of their job is required to get the pre-vaccination, which allows you to kind of, in case there is a problem, it's less treatment afterwards. So rabies isn't a problem for the most part with bats, and we know Large populations of bats aren't going to increase rabies. So the flip side of this is let's look at the benefits of bats. Why would we want to have bats around? Life in America would not be the same without bats. Desert ecosystems rely on nectar feeding bats as primary pollinators of the giant cacti, including the famous organ pipe and the saguaro of Arizona. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, is the role that these cactus, the bats play in the pollination of these. They also assist in seed dispersal for these plants. Tequila. For those of you that like to drink, it's produced from agave plants whose seed production drops to one three thousandth of normal without bat pollinators. We would have significantly less tequila if we didn't have bats. So let's talk about this pollination. I just mentioned this a little bit. I, I know when I was going to school and some of the some of the teachers I worked with when I was teaching um, used to used to make this claim. That nectar feeding bats, the, specifically the, the lesser long nose and the Mexican long tongue, those are our two nectar feeders. Remember, we have 28 species of bats. Two of them are nectar feeders. The other 26 are insect eaters. Um, are necessary pollinators for the survival of the columnar cactus. The argument is that when you look at a saguaro's blossom, they typically blossom at night. They're big, bright, white flowers that grow in clumps. And so the, the logic would seem since they come out at night, and because they're, they're these bright white flowers, they make it easier for bats to see in the time that bats would come out. And so the argument then has been, yes, they're important, but there are some people that have gone further to say that they are actually necessary for the pollination of these species, that without bats, species wouldn't survive at all. And that's kind of what's what many teach. But what I wanted to point, what, what, what's interesting is, is to look at what that might look like. How do we test if that's true? The easiest way is to look at their ranges. So I put together this map. And what I've done is I've created some layers in this map. 
I have the ranges of three of our common columnar cactus, the saguaro cactus, the organ pipe cactus, and the cardone cactus, which is further down, typically into the Mexico area. And then I've got the range of our of our two nectar feeding bats, the lesser long nose bat and the Mexican long tongue bat. Now, the argument is if they were obligate pollinators, meaning that the columnar cactus required bats for pollination, then their ranges should overlap. And they should overlap pretty much 100%. At least the, the cacti should be entirely enclosed within the range of these two bat species. So let's take a look. First of all, we'll pop up a, a rough approximation of the Saguaro cactus range. You can see that in green. I'm going to keep then that on there and we'll say there's the, the rough approximation of the organ pipe cactus range. And then we'll do the Cardone cactus range, which is in Baja. So those are the three ranges of the, the ranges of these three species of columnar cactus, which some have argued are need to have these bats to survive. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up the range of the lesser long nose bat. And obviously the lesser long nose bat extends beyond. So the, the, the long nose bat goes beyond where the these columnar cactus are, and that would be okay. Really, if the cactus needs the bat, then their range has to be fully enclosed within the, the bat's range. It doesn't have to be so the bat can have a larger range. You can see that for a big chunk of it, the, through half of Baja there, and a big chunk of, of the range, that the, that the Mexican long nose is in there, or the, the lesser long nose bat is in there. Now, if we look at the Mexican long tongue bat, it has a, quite a big range um, as well, an overlap with the other range. But you'll notice there are a decent number of areas where the cacti exist, where the bats do not. Okay? You can see there's some islands in Baja where the Cardone cactus is actually found, but the bats are not. And then as you spread north, or north into, into Arizona, typically these two bats north of about Tucson. We've had some sightings in some other places that are, that are popping up a little bit. Typically, they don't get much north of Tucson. Yet, we have saguaros all the way up in Phoenix. We have some saguaros that are pushing into Prescott and some of those areas as well. Um, you can see that the range doesn't fully overlap. So when you look at range maps and where these cacti are found, that gives you an amount of evidence that, yes, they might be important pollinators, but they aren't necessarily the definite that these cacti need them. Which is why when you start to study the biology of the saguaro a little bit more, you realize, yes, the bloom occurs at night, and it stays open through about halfway into the next day, which allows for doves and some of the other pollinators to come in. So while bats are a primary pollinator, the ranges indicate that they have adapted so that other animals will pollinate them as well. That's a map that you'll have access to, be able to bring those into your classroom if you wanted to as well. We've already talked about this a little bit, that the amount of bugs that bats can eat. Let's, let's deal with that a little bit more. They are, um, they control countless insect pests. As we mentioned, 70% of the world's bats eat insects. This is the, the pallid bat. It's one of my favorites because of their food preference. They actually forage primarily on larger insects like grasshoppers, cicadas, scorpions, and centipedes, which is a bonus. Those pests cost billions of dollars annually for American farmers. Um, so bats play a role in that. A colony of 150 big brown bats can protect local farmers from about 33 million rootworms each summer. Here's some a little bit more math. This gets a little bit trickier. You might need a calculator for this. Insectivorous bats can eat about half their weight in insects every night. Many of these insects, like moths, are considered pests because they can damage crops. If a bat weighs 16 grams and a moth weighs 0.4 grams, how many moths can the bat and one bat eat in one night? We'll do a little bit of calculation there. How many moths could one bat eat in one night? I'll give you just a second. We had a question here, good, a good question. Can we assume that all of the moth weight is converted to bat weight? For the piece of this activity, yes. For the simplicity of working with the students, I was just setting this up for that perspective. Absolutely, I would say that they convert that entire into, into energy that they would use. Is that true? Probably not. Probably other things. There's probably pieces that, but but for simplicity of, of the sake of this activity, yes. And most of you are getting this right. That one bat would eat about 20 moths each night. So how many moths would that individual bat eat from May to September, which is roughly the time that they are in Arizona? Do a little bit of math to calculate how many days is that? It's roughly May, June, July, August, September. 
each month has roughly 30 days in it. How many moths would that individual bat eat? About 3,000 in there, and, and you are correct. I actually added up when you talk about the days that have 31 days, it's about 1,060 moths. There are thought to be about 10,000 bats in the Phoenix Bat Tunnel that I've been bringing up. How many moths could the colony eat from May to September? Just for the sake of our thing here, I'm not going to have you do all of that, but it would be about 30.6 million moths that that one colony could eat. Just trying to show you some quick ways that you can take some of this learning and you can engage your students a little bit more in some of these other activities. Um, now they're doing some math problems, but they might be a little bit more interested because it's about something they might be interested in, which is bats. Second Cave, which I've already talked about in Central Texas, is home to is a summer home of Mexican free tail bats. So they can eat a million pounds nightly of insects. So the, you can you can start to to see the impact that bats could have on pests and control, such that if we have bats, we're less likely to need to use chemical pesticides. A million nursing bats eat up to 21.5 tons of insects nightly. So a bat's appetite translates to less need for pesticides. We get less of those chemicals that are in the air. We are just about done. I'll have a few things that I want to talk about after this, but I wanted to give you a moment before I start talking about those things to ask any questions that you might have. We have a um, good question here coming up about white nose syndrome. We'll talk about that a lot here. Probably right now, the, the greatest threat to bats is this thing called white nose syndrome, which is a fungus. It's a whitish fungus that gets on their nose. That's why it's called the white nose. Right now, my understanding is white nose syndrome has not made it into Arizona yet, but we are constantly checking bat populations for those types of things. But it is a fungus that spreads, and because they live in such tight quarters, um, the fungus can spread among the populations, and then it starts to impact the populations, and that they're going down. And it's something that we don't, like many of these disease-based population factors, we don't quite know what to do about it, which is a concern. Um, we don't know what causes it, what's what's spread, what how it continues to spread, what are the conditions. Once it's in a population, it's largely considered that it could be completely destructive or relatively destructive, just like anything. There's going to be a certain amount of survival that comes out of a population. But that is the greatest threat that we have right now is on white nose syndrome. In the educational activities that I have, and so the information that I have for you, information and handouts and all kinds of stuff on white nose syndrome for you to be educated on them, that's the biggest threat that we have right now for, for the bats. Um, like I said, hasn't made an appearance, as far as I know, in Arizona yet, we've seen, but it's something that we're constantly monitoring populations for. Um, again, continue to write some questions down. What I want to do is just throw up some credits here. There's a number of photographs that we're using here. wanted to give credit to those. In addition, the, 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 this original PowerPoint came from um, Nancy Renison, who used to be a bat biologist for Arizona Game of Fish has since retired a number of years ago. I've made modifications to it a little bit, made some changes, added the educational activities, but obviously the, the initial credit goes to her on creating that. So let's talk about some of these resources while the questions keep coming in. First of all, I do have information on staying in touch. We, I run a Facebook page on Focus Wild where I post a lot of workshop information. Many of you probably heard it through Facebook. Um, and then also we have an e-news sign up if you go to azgfc.gov. Or .com, either one will get you there. In the upper left-hand corner, I believe there's a button that says sign up for e-news. You do that, you select the education one, and you'll get information from on our education listserv. Now, the last thing I want to talk about then is bat resources that are available to you. azgft.gov slash focus wild is our, that's, that's our, that's our education homepage that, that has all the wildlife education things. And on the left-hand side, all sorts of navigations, but you have information on lessons, workshops, the classroom programs one is changing a little bit, resources. The one that you're most interested in for today's topic, though, is the themes. What we've done in the theme section is I put together themed resources. So sometimes when I do a workshop on a topic like bats, for example, I want to gather all the resources that I have or that I'm familiar with that are related to that topic. So all I've done is take an existing resource. Some of these are found in other parts of our website. They might be found from some of our partners, and I put them together in one location. So with that, I'm going to go through some of the questions that people have posted and try to answer some of those that are in here. So is there, are there other threat, threats to bat populations? They're going to be all your typical ones. Obviously, habitat destruction is going to be a big one that, that tends to be a, a big one with, with 
any species that's out there. Climate change is going to be impacting it. We, we talk about, I mentioned very, very briefly when I was talking about the range maps of the, the bats, we've been seeing some sightings of those long nose and the long tongue in some areas north of where they typically are found. We're seeing a northern Northern progression of some of these bats, which is what we tend to see with things like climate change, right? As the climate warms up, the species tend to move to higher latitudes and higher altitudes to, to get to what was what they're used to. So climate change is obviously going to be there. Habitat destruction is going to be there. With that, then I want to thank you. I'm done.